Hey, everybody. Welcome. I'm Adarsh Pandit. This is Harlow. I'm Harlow Ward. And we are both from ThoughtBot. And today, we're going to do a giant group pairing exercise where we're going to walk through how to do test-driven development. Um, there's some prerequisite stuff up here. If you haven't had the chance to clone the repo, uh, please do so. If you have trouble, please raise your hand. We have a number of awesome TAs who are running around uh, who will help you. There are also uh, your neighbors nearby. Many of you have paired already, and uh, that's great. So please help one another out. This is a workshop setup, so we're going to do some live coding, and you, know, you guys can follow along. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a sec. We have a USB stick now, too, with all of the gems on it, so if you're still struggling with it, uh, raise your hand at some point, and one of our guys will come over and get you all set up. So we've got some folks right here on the aisle. Yeah, it's being used right now. Okay, okay. great. So this is who we are. Uh, we're both developers at ThoughtBot. This is where you can find us on email and the Twitter. And uh, we work for ThoughtBot. ThoughtBot is a Rails consultancy and iOS. Uh, we have developers and designers and wonderful iOS developers. We build startups um, for the mobile and the web, and it's a lot of fun. We also have a lot of uh, gems, open source gems and tools that we manage. And you can find them all at thoughtbot.com slash community. And this is Ralph the Robot in ASCII art. OK, so some housekeeping stuff. We're going to do a two-part workshop. Initially, this might have been described as one half talk and one half workshop, but we figure we're just going to be showing code anyhow, so we're going to do this as a giant workshop. And what that means is we're going to be demonstrating, um, we'll be demonstrating code up here. Harlow and I are going to pair, and uh, you guys can code along out in the audience. So in our typical work day, if we're working on some client work, um, Pairing, we'll be doing what we call ping pong, where I'll write a test that fails. Otter shall write some code to make it pass. He'll write the next failing test, comes back to me. And so we'll go back and forth like that. It keeps a set of eyes on it. And it's uh, nice during the refactoring phase that you're quite often uh, refactoring someone else's code, which is great to have that second set of eyes. Yeah, exactly. Um, many of you are of different levels of experience. This is probably best for somebody with some Rails experience, although in our experience, we found that even exposing yourself or watching things that are over your head uh, will allow you to make some notes on things to look up later. And some of it may make sense to you further on down the line. So definitely don't get dissuaded. Uh, there's a lot of complex stuff we're going to go over. And if you have questions, uh, please let us know. I think that's right, and it's, and it's really, um, my main goal of this talk is to hopefully expose a few of the techniques that we've been using over the last couple of years. Um, things that when I started developing in Ruby, um, it can be a bit of a hurdle, not knowing how to test something. Um, so these are some techniques we've learned over the last couple of years of uh, how to test certain scenarios that may seem troublesome up front. So in terms of format, we're going to, we have a bunch of different modules, which we'll walk through. Um, we'll introduce a topic like integration testing. And then we'll talk about it for a few minutes. Then we'll actually live TDD um, the feature. So that's sort of how we're going to go through it. And in between, we'll stop for comments or questions. And this is meant to be very interactive. So if you have questions, you know, let us know, comments, any of that. There, shout out questions as you have them. Your neighbors are also super useful. We definitely encourage you guys to pair. We're going to simulate the pairing experience up here to give you a sense of what that's like. Uh, it's the best way, in our opinion, to learn how to be a developer and to learn Ruby or Rails or anything is to share a computer. You pick up so much just in the shared experience. And we have a number of TAs, as I mentioned, running around. Uh, wearing ThoughtBot oriented gear. Can you guys raise your hands for you up? There we are. So take a look around. Uh, if you have any issues, these guys can come and uh, help out. 
Caleb is confusing our hand raising <laughs> setup. So we're going to have the, the ThoughtBot repo which you guys forked. We're going to commit to that as we're doing our work. And so you can refer to that and see the code that we've uh, committed, Wi-Fi permitting. Um, and that way you can follow along. And you can also commit to your own forks and have a record of how this went for you guys. And you can do a compare and contrast. Right, so the, the main goal here is to, to write our tests first. And <coughs> the, the thought here is that with writing the test first, we're going to get the code that we need for this feature in, and hopefully not more. Um, so we have a smoke test app that you guys have all got running locally here. It's a really basic to-dos application. Um, right now, you should be able to run the test suite. That test suite demonstrates um, creating a to-do. And our next step is going to be writing some code to be able to complete these to-dos. So when we talk about test-driven development, um, raise your hand if you're familiar with test-driven development. You know what it means. OK, great. Raise your hand if you practice test-driven development. All right, keep your hand up. Keep your hand up if you practice test-driven development 100% of the time. All right, great. You're in the right place. A lot of part of our, our talk title uses the word discipline, and that's really what it takes. It takes practice and discipline, and we'll show you a little bit of how we do what we do and show you uh, test-driven development. I think seeing it is a lot easier than learning it out of a book. So wherever possible, see someone or meet somebody who's better than you and at test-driven development and pair with them. That's a great way to learn. So some of the benefits, I'll just skim through these since everybody seems to be fairly familiar with them. Uh, you set the expected outcome first. Uh, it forces you to consider the purpose of your code before you write it, which I think is very important. Otherwise, you can end up on what I call a jazz odyssey of coding, where you're kind of meandering around. It reduces bugs and rework. Uh, it tells you as you're developing if something you've done has changed or broken something else. It serves as a form of documentation that lives on in the repository and instructs other developers as to what your code actually does. And uh, is, is everybody familiar with the red-green refactor cycle? OK, so I'll touch on that quickly. So what that means is red and green refer to the color of the test outputs. So if your test fails, it's red. And if it's green, it passes. And we, uh, the term red, green, refactor, we actually treat a little more like red, 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 continuous red until you get to that green. And we really let the test drive the code that we're adding. Um, so the, the test will assert something. Um, it's a feature, so there's, there's multiple assertions kind of on the way here. And we'll add elements to the code base. Um, we'll kind of let the test drive us to the passing code. Yep. So let's get into it. Do you want to lead us off? Yeah, absolutely. First section. So part of the, the pairing experience is about communication and talking through problems with your pair. So uh, we're going to alternate who's going to be writing code and tests. And so Harlow's going to be typing for a bit, and then we'll swap places. And it's, it'll give you a feel for roughly how we typically will pair. Um, why don't we walk through <coughs> the kind of smoke test that's in place right now? Yeah. Um, make sure that we all kind of understand what's happening here um, at a task. Yeah, that sounds good. So uh, this is, for those of you who were around yesterday and saw the RSpec Capybara talk, uh, doing integration testing. Really what that means is integrating your full web application stack and testing it as a unit. Um, there are a number of ways to do it, but really what you're doing in the old days was writing a script and saying to some poor person who you're paying to do this repeatedly, um, you know, log in as Joe Smith, 
add this password and make sure that everything works. Nowadays, we have automated browser testing with Capybara or uh, Cucumber and so on. So we're gonna, the model we're going to use is RSpec Capybara, which is what you might have seen yesterday. I think this has been a, we were using Cucumber for a long time, and I think the new DSL with Capybara has been a win for us. So we kind of have this feature scenario, which comes with Capybara 2.0. Um, so the way that we write these tests now feels a lot like we were writing as far as the Cucumber features go. Um, but I feel like with the RSpec integration tests, uh, we're a lot closer to the Capybara steps now, which feels pretty natural as you're working in a code base. Yeah. So these are the tests that you already have in your repository. So the, the file name will be down here, but I'll tell you what it is. This is Vim, for those of you who are Vim enthusiasts, like many of us at ThoughtBot. This file is in spec features user manages tasks underscore spec dot rb. <coughs> so just to show, um, so we're going to add a new feature. Right. And the, what we have for the application, uh, can we spin up the, the server and show it quickly? Sure. So this application is dead simple. It should be easy to follow. It's a to-do application like every learning application. All you can do is you sort of create, read, or create, edit, and uh, destroy some, t some task. So it's pretty simple. It looks like this. So we can click new task. And for those of you who are not familiar with what we did here, we typed Rails server at the prompt, and then went to localhost 3000. Or you can set the port to 5000 in this case. So what Harlow did was just add mobile one as a task, and then hit create a task, and then it went back to our index of all the tasks. So super simple CRUD application at this point. Um, and now what we want to do is add the ability to complete a task. Um, we probably won't use the web browser again, and I encourage people not to unless you're troubleshooting something that, uh, that you can't figure it out through the terminal. Um, but most of the time we'll be in the terminal looking at the failed steps and then fixing from there. Um, it's, it becomes a little bit... It's a little awkward at first um, not being in the web browser, um, but your productivity goes up over time, being able to uh, work directly out of the <laughs> terminal. Everything's closer. So for those of you familiar with Cucumber, we use some similar nomenclature scenarios um, and features. So this whole feature, if we go to the top, is called uh, user manages tasks. And the scenario we want to write is uh, mark the task as complete. So we can use Capybara's syntax to drive a browser around. So in this case, what Harlow's doing is he's um, setting a task name. That's exactly right. And the Capybara DSL, um, we put some kind of cheat sheets, they're PDFs in the main repo, links to them. Um, and that'll give a nice overview of um, all of the actions you can take using Capybara. Um, you have the option to fill in the name field, click buttons, uh, et cetera there. So I think I might have, so I think in line 25 we need an equals. Task underscore name equals mobile on. Correct. Unless it's a method that you just wrote. <laughs> so what we did is we said scenario mark, mark task complete. We made a variable with the fake task name that we wanted to use. Line 27, we said visit root path, which means go to the root in the browser. Click link new task. So Capybara will look for this, any kind of link with this text in it. If there's more than one, it'll complain. It'll ask you to be more specific. You can actually, um, if it's within a div or a span, excuse me, you can specify that. Then for forms, you can type fill in, uh, and then again, you specify the field name. So here it would be name, with, and then the task name that we set up at the top. And then we click the button, create task. So this is just a script that mimics what we just showed in the browser. 
That's exactly right. So we're doing a, um, so part of the process here is we're gonna kind of write the code to get this to pass, and you'll notice that we're adding a bit of duplication in here, and that'll be part of the refactoring step where we treat the testing, uh, the <coughs> test code base, just like we would the regular code base, and we'll show some techniques for stripping duplication from that area there too. Um, so what I'm hoping to do right now is um, write a failing test that makes me add a, a complete task um, button to the interface, and then um, that will kind of demonstrate how we go forward and add code to the views. So what Harlow's doing here is what I had mentioned earlier. So within uh, this HTML element, we're looking for um, specific, um, a specific tag. So we're hoping that the TD, which is the list element, or the, sorry, the table element, when it contains the task name, what we want to do is click complete. So next to, so we're setting an expectation here which doesn't exist in our application. And that expectation is next to every to-do, we want a link that says complete. And then here at the bottom, we're gonna write an assertion that says, okay, well we expect um, that we won't have this link any longer. And one thing you might note is that we've put some new lines here at line 30 and 34. Just as a matter of style, we like to separate the phases of the test. So there are four phases to the classic test. It's set up, uh, set up, exercise, assert, and then tear down. So the setup is everything you do before the thing you want to test. The exercise is the actual thing that you want to test. The assertion is an active assertion that says, I expect this thing to have happened. I expect to be logged in and so on. And then the tear down, at least in our respect, is actually done in the background. So we don't do that as explicitly. Um, and then if you notice here, when I'm running this test uh, with RSpec, um, we're pinpointing the file directly, and using a colon, you can specify the line number of the test, and that could have been any line between 24 and 36. Um, and that way, as you're working on a specific feature in your app, um, you can just run that particular test at the end of the task, we'll want to run all of the tests to make sure we haven't broken anything. Um, but this just allows your tests to run more quickly uh, and hopefully in a little bit of isolation here. So for those of you who can't see it, at the bottom when we run a test, it's our spec and then the file name. And then here we, we did colon and then the line number. You can see that here. Our spec, spec features, user manages tasks, colon 24. So then we only run that test. If we left off the colon 24, it run the whole test. Do you want to uh, get in here and make this pass? Yeah. Let's see if I can do it. Any questions so far on the DSL or the code up here? What is FD? Okay, so FD is a flag on RSpect, which is format and documentation mode. Um, when I'm running a single test, I kind of like that. It'll kind of show you uh, which assertions failed in English. Uh, when we run the whole test suite, we'll take off the FD and then you'll just get the dots, uh, which is kind of the progress run. So the essence of TDD is to let your errors drive what you're doing. So I'm looking at this error, and it says failure error within TD contains task name, do no quick error CSS, syntax error, unexpected space after mo. Uh, do you think there's an error in having a space for our task name? Is that what's going on there? Good question. Um, do you want to fire up the, let's see here. Also, just to set expectations, we will be making mistakes and 
fumbling through things <laughs> along the way. This is part of the joy of TDD. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> so why don't I try a task name that has no spaces? We should be fine because on 16 there we have a mow the lawn task already. We're visiting the root path, new task, fill in name with task name, click button, create task. Um, I have a question. Yes. So it seems like the step before actually writing the test is sitting down and saying, how are we going to structure it? And then saying, how are we going to test that? It's a great point. Absolutely. I mean, but not everyone can hear that. Oh, sorry. Um, so the, the comment question was, um, some thought has gone into this before writing the test. And that we're going to test that there is a flag or a class on this TD here that is completed. Um, quite often that'll be a designer we're working with adding a class name um, in the HTML. Um, but we'll try to work together and communicate um, kind of what happens on the front end HTML. But you're absolutely right that, that I think part of the great part of writing these tests is it kind of makes you think about the user's flow up front um, before you actually write any code into your application. So when you say, um, so, so you struggle with sitting down and you're going to write tests, but you're not sure how they're going to end up, um, do you have a, like a definition of the feature that you're trying to accomplish? I think that's usually a nice way to um, think about the code that you're going to write. So when we write these scenarios, we try to write them uh, with an actor and then what they're going to do on the system. So for an example here, um, this feature is uh, user manages their to-dos. So that's a very limited scope to this test now, right? And then within there, we'd have a scenario, maybe adding a task, editing a task if that's possible, completing a task. Um, does it make sense? Okay, cool. I found the bug. So within the task name, that needs to be in single quotes. Ah, okay, that makes sense. All right, so now our error says, failure error, click link complete, capybara element not found, unable to find link complete. So what that means is we have to make a link that says complete. So we're going to put that in our view. Does that sound right? That sounds right. So we'll go into view. Uh, let me do this the full way. App, views, tasks. And then this would be hiding under index. So we have a render here, which is rendering all the tasks. So we'll have a partial, which should be underscore task, um, which will have the individual tasks and the HTML surrounding them. So we'll go into the partial here. And again, this is app views tasks underscore task dot HTML. So now we have the task name. And let's add a complete link. So he's going to write the minimum amount of code to get this test passing now. So I'm going to move this TD tag to the end. So task, or I guess link to, complete. Um, so we're going to want to send this to an action and in this case, I think we should use a separate controller. Does that sound right? I like that. OK. So let's call it the task completions path. And again, here we're writing the code that we wish we had. So what we're saying here is we're going to create a new controller called completions. And we're going to post to that. And so when someone posts to the completions controller, it'll mark that particular task as complete. Um, this is a technique we use quite often to 
um, really be explicit about the action that's happening here. Um, so let's run the test again. Okay. Great, so, so the tests are guiding us here. It's telling us we have an undefined method, task completions path. That means that we're missing a route. So now this will force us to jump into our routes file, add a new route for the task completion. So we should probably nest this, I think. So within each task, it should have that's exactly right. So we'll need a nested route here so we can grab the task ID out of the URL. And then in the, uh, I guess it'll be the create action, uh, we can then pull that out in the params. So there's a route. Let's see if I type that right. I'm just going to clear the screen beforehand. And there's a few tools that we'll link to um, also that we've been using to help speed up tests. Um, there's a gem called Spring that we've had good experiences with. Uh, we didn't introduce it um, for the setup part, um, but look for it in the RubyConf tutorial, or RailsConf tutorial website. So we have a failure here that says template error, undefined local variable or method post. And it's failing, again, it's giving us the stack trace where things are failing. It's in task line four. So if we go back to the previous file, line four, this is where we're failing. And we don't have a post method for this controller. So it feels like we should put the controller in. Is that right? Uh, you need to have, right, uh, post needs to be a uh, symbol over there of the method type. Oh, yeah. Thanks. See? Mistakes are made. This is the joy of pairing, is that things get spotted much faster. Oh, yeah, because I left off the, the colon, so it didn't route, uh, understand it as a symbol. Great. So we're missing a controller now. Let's make a controller. So I'm going to go app, controllers, uh, what should we call this thing? So I wanted this one to be the completions controller. Yeah. So class, completions, controller, application, controller. So it's going to inherit. Let's give it a method. We'll create. Well, wait a minute. You're, waiting, you're writing a lot of code here. Yep, you're right. Jumping ahead. <laughs> Thanks for catching that. <laughs> One step at a time. One step at a time. So our failure was we're missing the controller. I add just the bare controller. And now we get an error here, which says the create action could not be found for this completions controller. So the next step, the thing I jumped ahead to, is to write the create method. So I think we'd probably want to do, we'd probably want to find the task. Probably have a param available. And then we'd want to touch completed at. And this task ID is available um, because it's a nested resource now. So the URL would look like tasks, the ID of it, and then completions uh, towards the end of the URL. So this will make the task completed, and then we're going to redirect to the root path. So we'll just redirect back to where we started. Run our tests again. get some hot SQL here. Active record statement invalid. SQL light three, SQL exception, no such column completed at. Update task set updated at. 
et cetera. So what this tells me is that I have no completed at method in my database, so I need to create a migration to add that to the database. So I'm going to use the Rails generator. So it's Rails generator migration. Let's call this add completion date to tasks, RB. I don't think you need the RB there. Ah, you're right. And it should be Rails generate. Yes. Thanks. So the other nice thing about this now is it, the tests are driving our data structure too. And um, so we're not kind of doing upfront design on fields that we think we're going to need. We're allowing the tests to actually um, have us add these fields to the models too. So what we're going to do is we're going to make the completed at column a timestamp so that it'll store the time at which we completed it. Does that look right? Looks good to me. Okay. So let's do rake db migrate and then db test prepare. I forget to do rake db test prepare so often I created an alias to just that's just migrate and it does both of these together. So those are separate databases, your, your um, development database and your test database, and this will migrate both. Looks like it worked. Let's run our tests again. Great. So what we're failing to see here is some CSS. Expect page to have CSS TDD completed, or TD completed, text task name. So it's saying can't find this within this, with this text inside of it. So let's go back to the view. Oh, sorry, the task. Let's only put this. It looks like we've got an extra TD in here now. How about if we added the class to the surrounding TD there? Yeah. Good call. So we'll definitely add this task class. And then let's add another class if it's completed. How's that sound? Looks good. So let's use a little Ruby, a little herb. Make it completed if task completed at. Hmm. Close that quote and close the tag. Does that look right? That looks good to me. So when the button's clicked, a post is sent to the completions controller. Completion controller looks up the task, um, touches the completed at, which is a Rails method that puts a timestamp uh, at the current time and then redirects back to the root path. And now on the root path, when this HTML is regenerated, we should have a completed class on this TD. We'll run our tests again. Look at that. Our first green tests. There we go. <laughs> so now it's time exciting. to take a look at some of the code we've written. Yeah. and see if we can make some improvements. So I'm doing a git diff. So what that's going to do is show the changes that we've made. So here's our view. Looks pretty good. I don't think there's anything we can refactor here. And we're typically looking for areas of duplication, um, especially naming. 
Uh, it's so important that it's uh, worth a second read to make sure that all of our variable names make sense. So I think of routes look good. This is our schema. You can see that it added this column to our table. Right. So this is my error that I fixed in the documentation. So we'll commit that. Here's our scenario. So I feel like this looks pretty good. Uh, there's a part of me that thinks that these, um, the have CSS selector, uh, might be nice to hide that behind a method name um, to make our intention there a little more obvious and hide some of the implementation of the view. Sure. Let's go back to our spec. Spec features right here. So you're saying this have CSS TD completed, that guy? Yeah, I think the, the reader of the test doesn't need to know that there's a TD with completed. So maybe we can put that under a method um, of like have completed task or something of that nature. And then pass in the tasking? Yeah, I like that. Can I do this? What do you think of that? Yep. I kind of feel the same way of the uh, complete, too. Um, so we thing? can now make this test start to read a little more English-like um, by hiding away some of these capybara steps here. Well, let's make sure this guy passes first. Yes, good call. So now is when I start to run the full test suite just to make sure, uh, sorry, the full test file to make sure that it's all uh, working, especially when I start adding methods. So that looks good. Actually, I'm going to commit this real quick. In your feature branch, which I see you created. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so embarrassing. Live coding. So our typical kind of development process here will be to create a well-named feature branch um, with the initials uh, of the person coding. Uh, when we get to a point where we feel like our code's looking pretty good, we'll push that feature branch up to GitHub, um, create a pull request, and then put that pull request in the campfire where our other teammates can jump in and add comments and hopefully give good feedback on uh, the code that we're trying to get into master. Passing test to complete task. So normally what I would do is use bullets here in the commit message and put a lot more detail regarding what this commit is. We like to use our git commit history as a sort of, um, as the history of the application. Um, and here's where we usually will do it. But for sake of time, I'm just going to leave it like this. Git push. And what Audrish is doing here is making a commit with the passing tests. Um, this is a pretty simple feature, but on a bigger feature where we might want to move around some code, it's nice to have a, a point in time where everything was green that we can reference um, in case something goes wrong during the refactoring phase. So it looks clean. So you're saying that we try and refactor something else out of here? Yeah, I feel like the, uh, the TD contains, uh, the reader of the test might not care so much about the fact that it could be a TD or an LI or whatnot, so why don't we put that behind a well-named method also. What do you think for a name? Um, I mean, what's, what's it doing? We're completing a task, right? Yeah. So maybe we could have a method called complete task and then pass it the task name? Yeah, that, looks, that sounds good. So let's do that. Uh, so you'll actually want to grab the within uh, yeah. there, too. How's that look? I see. Yeah? Oh, let's put a parameter in here, since we're passing one down. 
I feel comfortable moving the click link down too. So maybe just pull that whole block down. All right. And then you'll need the do end around there. Yeah, there we go. Let's run the test again. So the method is complete task, task name. So then, yep, that looks good. So what we've done there is we've extracted a method that hides the implementation and reads a little bit more nicely. So that's good. I like that. Looks good. So I'm going to commit this also. I think the one more thing I noticed was there, that when we're looking at the first code that was running for the add task, mm -hmm. um, we repeated a bunch of that for the completion. Uh, so I feel like maybe it would be nice to extract that into a method that maybe both scenarios could use. Yeah, so what you're saying is this, uh, this whole setup here? Right, exactly. OK. So I'd probably keep the task name variable in there, but maybe we could create a method called create task. And that would then drive Capybara to create the task. Like that? You got it. So let's call this create task, task name. Like that? So let's make sure we're still passing now. Yep, looks good. Great. And then we should be able to uh, reuse that method in the first scenario, which is adding a task. Like and that'll, that? be, that'll be create task, though. So you have complete, but that's going to be create, yeah. Yeah. Oh, hi, sorry. For the view all task scenario, you get the task like with the model. Yes. And for this one, you are kind of driving the browser. That's exactly right. Why choose one over the other? No, totally. Um, so we're going to, we'll talk about the model one in the next section. But the thought here is that you want to verify with an integration test that um, some steps happen. And I think uh, verifying the creating a task um, through the web browser works is great. And then the one thing we have to be careful with integration tests is they're a lot slower than unit tests. So being able to pre-populate some data into our database and then assert that it shows up on a page is a way for us to do some setup in the system. So right now we're kind of manually setting up in the other two, um, but with the, uh, what was it, view task, we're kind of priming the database with some data and then uh, asserting values on the view to make sure that data exists. So this. So, so that's, a, that's a good question, but we haven't changed any of the assertions, though. So if the assertions are still running green, we can typically feel pretty good that some of the setup steps um, haven't been broken because the, the test is still, the assertion is still green on that test. Okay. So that's interesting. So, so uh, participant has worked at a company where they did some refactoring and tests, and they started getting false positives because. Um, some things have changed in the test suite, but the assertions weren't kind of asserting on the right things now. Um, it's definitely something to watch out for. 
we typically do a lot of refactoring in our tests. We treat it as part of a first citizen in our code base um, and aggressively try to get rid of duplication with the hope that they become easier to read. Um, but I think it's definitely, I wouldn't do that in a, uh, in a feature that had nothing to do with that part of the test suite. Like that could be maybe its own refactoring in itself. Um, and then obviously have someone look at it to make sure that, that what we're asserting still makes sense there. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And two things uh, that are important to mention. One is that tests are still code, and you should treat it with all the same principles that you would code. So you should try and keep it dry and extract methods and try and refactor it wherever possible. Um, so that's really important. And uh, one of the things that you might catch as you're refactoring your tests uh, is errors where you're removing assertions or changing them or basically changing the intent of the test. And you can catch that not just in pair programming, but through the code review process. So that's a great place where if you're changing tests, which again, it's a great point. They're very valuable and you don't want to remove their power. Um, the code review process and pair programming really allow you to catch any errors along the way. Yeah, I think we use the tests um, really to kind of drive the way we design the system. And I think it's a little bit scary to say that because your test suite passes that you are totally confident that everything in your system is correct because they're not going to catch every bug. I mean, so we still need to be active about um, as people testing the code that we're putting out there um, to verify that expected behavior is happening. Okay. Does that look right? How do you feel? This feels pretty good. It feels like we've removed some duplication with this create task method, which is really nice. Um, we're able to complete the task and then have the completed task uh, visible. This reads a lot more nicely to me. So we're setting a task name. Let's create the task then let's complete the task, and then we expect the page to have the completed task. So this goes back to that point about documentation. When this, this test right here tells me exactly what feature the web application should have. So I like it. I think these were good suggestions. Great. So why don't we do a push up to GitHub now, and yep. we can do a compare against master and give it a last set of eyes. So we created the completions controller, gave it a create method. Um, we updated the completed at timestamp, then redirected to root. That looks right. Uh, in the view, we added a nice conditional class tag. I think that was really, really nice. Um, and then we have a link to a complete. I like that we extracted the completions through a separate controller. So we've encapsulated that logic elsewhere. That's great. Um, you may have, some of you have used routes before. You might not have seen these, but we like to restrict the available routes to only the ones that we use. Keeps your routes file a lot cleaner. Right, and so when uh, you're doing rake routes later, you don't have a bunch of noise in there of routes that may not exist. Exactly. That looks good. Your migration is good. Looks like it worked. And I screwed up our slides, so we'll fix that. And then we've extracted some methods here. Added a new scenario. Yep, looks good to me. Great. So I'm going to squash this down. Yep. Can you talk a little bit about what squashing is? Absolutely. So, so when we're working in a feature branch, um, quite often we'll make either some work in progress commits or we have a commit for our first passing test. We have another commit for extracting a method. Um, and this kind of muddies up our git log a little bit. So as a whole, we want to have one nice git commit message for this entire feature. So what Otters is doing right now is called uh, an interactive rebase. So he's taking all of the commits we've made in this feature branch and squashing them down into hopefully one very nicely named commit um, that will have a good overview of what this code is adding to the code base. 
Um, and quite often, if we're using a, um, a tracking system such as you know, Pivotal or Trajectory or Trello or um, Jira, we'll also add a link at the bottom of this um, commit message here to the original uh, feature request, and that will give future developers um, looking at our commit log uh, another reference to where this code came from, what the intention was behind it. So write a little note, a couple lines describing what that says. Commit that. I'm going to git push to the branch, and it's going to complain because I've changed the history in the branch. So it's going to reject it. Uh, I'm going to git push force. This is something you should only do in a feature branch. Never git push force to master. So if I look at the git log, there it is. And now I'm going to merge this in. Looks good. The one step we would have typically in our regular workflow is doing the pull request on GitHub. Um, we'll skip that step for now. Oop. I'm going to delete this branch. Clean up after myself. Whoops. Delete branch there. I'm using a number of aliases. Um, I'm going to try not to use them where possible. If you want to look and see where they are, they're in my dot files, and I'll point you to those at the end. And this just does a cleanup locally of deleting your local branch and then also deleting your remote branch to keep your repository tidy. So cool, so that's our first um, acceptance test built in kind of a TDD fashion, starting from the outside and then going in as we needed to create um, new attributes on the task and kind of allowing Capybara to drive the way that we develop in an application. Yeah, and one of the things, as Harlow caught me jumping ahead, one of the things that's really critical is to really only focus on what that error message is and only solve that one error message and let it proceed you through the process. And then you really have a, a voice telling you um, like what's the next piece of code you need to add to your code base. Um, I find it now very hard to even write code without the test telling me what to do. It's, it's kind of like the whole, once you start to get comfortable with TDD, um, you really rely on your tests a lot to tell you what your next decisions are, um, adding code for a feature. So that's, um, that's one segment. We have many more ahead. But before we charge ahead, does anybody have questions on what we did? Any, uh, anything seem uh, out of the ordinary? Yeah, let's have some questions.